the insects have a property, or that the arthropods have a property, uh, segmentation, mm -hmm. which enabled them to radiate in, in certain ways. I think right. that's so different from group selection. Yeah, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't impose any requirements on individuals or populations to work against their own self-interest. Precisely, yes. precisely. So it's, it's entirely yes. compatible. So we're not, we're not talking about in, individuals sacrificing themselves for the Correct. good of the echinoderms. I mean, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't, if that's not what, what, what it's about at all. No. Um, but then we could sort of ask, well, what are the embryological features which are evolvable? What about symmetry, for example? I mean, bilateral symmetry, um, uh, five-way symmetry, as in starfish, uh, radiolaria. Uh, there, there are sim rules of symmetry which are sort of built into the embryology uh, and such that when, when a mutation happens which might or might not be selected in ordinary what neo-Darwinian selection, if we're talking about a, fi a five-way symmetrical starfish, yes. a mutation that changes one arm is going to change all five in the same way uh, right. normally. So it's, it's a, like, like a kaleidoscope. It's, a, it's something happens all around the, the, uh, the, um, the, the radial symmetry. And in a bilaterally symmetrical animal, a mutation that affects the third leg from the front on the right-hand side is going to affect the, I mean, not yes. always, but that's, that would be the general rule. Yeah, and another way to think of it is, is that, you know, we kind of put ourselves in these Darwinian straitjackets because now you've got this radial symmetry, and if you're under conditions where, for instance, fast-forward movement is up at a premium, the, the, the bilateral animals are going to have a natural advantage, yeah, yeah. and it's going to take extra work for an echinoderm to tweak itself so that it can... That's right. right. I mean, extra work is a very good phrase because yes. it, it's not impossible. It, right. it, it could happen. But by the time the echinoderms have sort of got themselves together to do it, um, some bilaterally symmetrical phylum will have, will have done it first. Yes, or have done it better. Or right. done it better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I think you, you're, you're not supporting group selection in the sort of um, Win Edwards or indeed I, I think we've, we've got a, a foundation in neo-Darwinian theory that is pretty sound, okay? It's, if, if we're going to add things to that theory, they can't really contradict the foundation that we've already got. So in, in that sense, any, any theory that comes along is going to challenge some of the concept, concepts that come out of neo-Darwinian theory. Uh, it, it's going to be like those echinoderms. It's got something really working against it for that particular strategy. Um, so yeah, I, I think any any idea of group selection or clade selection has to accommodate itself to the existing body of evidence. Okay, and that, that's so, sometimes hard to do. Well, well I, I'd like to pursue your point about um, what, what's what's difficult to 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 evolve. Um, if if you think about any any animal as sitting in a sort of mathematical multidimensional space where it could move in all sorts of uh -huh. of directions. Um, in, in, I'm talking about in evolutionary time right. now. now. Um, I suppose that there are some, I mean, it's for example, lengthening the horns or, or, or lengthening the legs or shortening the tail or, or all the different yeah. dimensions of, of evolutionary movement. And so evolution then would consist of a trajectory through multidimensional space. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be that there are certain directions which are which are resistant there are there are there are certain um, well let, let, let's call it a, a multi-dimensional museum with 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 cases filled with all possible mm -hmm. animals and you walk along this corridor and you see the horns getting longer you walk along that corridor and you see the coat getting blacker and and there are any number of these corridors there will be some corridors which are which are sort of Blocked off, or not not totally blocked off, but but um, hard to traverse. Yes, for for some particular group, whereas other corridors may be so easy that it, it's almost you could say they're kind of eager to evolve in in certain directions. Would that be fair? Do you think? Right, and and also that uh, you know. Now, in your imaginary corridor where, for instance, horns are getting long, the, the, the example that comes to mind is scarab beetles. 
Yes, where what good. they found is that you know you look at scarab beetles and you get this huge range of variation in the horns. You know, some species have none at all. Some have huge horns. Uh, and, and when you look at the development of in individuals in those species, what you find is that there are some interesting allometric relationships oh, between yes, the yeah. tissues. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, so one constraint is you can't grow a horn infinitely large because it is taking resources from other tissues of the body. Uh, and the, the, the example in various experiments is, you know, you, you, if you enlarge the horns, you get reduced testes size, and if you, yes. if you cut the horns off, yes. the testes grow huge. Uh, so there's a kind of seesaw going on right there. Yes. Perhaps so, we ought to clarify, the, these, the, these seesaws, these, these um, relationships between growth in different parts of the body, um, those could be um, fundamentally part of the embryology. You, you just cannot grow correct. larger horns without the testes getting smaller. Or they could be um, selective effects that, that um, say, resources that get put into the horns um, get, have, to, have to be stolen from Peter to, play, to pay Paul. Have yes. to be, and and that, that's a selective effect. Uh, I suppose the thing we, we missed out when talking about evolution of evolvability, it's not just that some phyla might be better at evolving than others, but that there really is a kind of evolutionary effect whereby phyla get better at evolving as the maybe tens of millions of years go by. And that's a novel way of looking at things. That's not a very Darwinian way of looking at things. It's not just that individuals get better at surviving and reproducing, which we're all familiar with. It's that f classes, orders, phyla, get better at evolving as the much larger time scales go, go by. Yes. Because whenever a new embryological trick is discovered, which may or may not, and presumably it has to in improve e in individual survival, but that's not what we're talking about now. It not only improves individual survival, down the line, it improves the evolvability of descendants, d distant, d distant descendants. Right. So when the first segmented arthropod, some kind of homeotic mutant, um, m maybe that maybe that the, before that there was only one segment and then there were two. Um, maybe the first segmented arthropod was not that great at surviving as an individual but its descendants were very good at evolving. Is that possible, do you think? Yes, although, you know, with that example, I'm, I'm actually thinking of arguing against evolvability, which, which feels horrible. But, uh, um, the, you know, the other phenomenon going on there is that this may be an epiphenomenon, that what you see when you look at the development of organisms is you see this incredible amount of redundancy, that what's going on in a population is that, of course, what you want to do is you want your you want your offspring to grow up reliably, right? So there's there's selection for added levels of control to make sure that everything's more and more robust. But that's got the, the interesting side effect that what you're doing is you're adding all these control mechanisms, things are getting more and more complicated over time, all, all to guarantee this reliability, but all those different bits and pieces also become new parts of the toolbox. Yeah. So that downstream, which you find you know, many generations later, is you've got this rich repertoire of molecules bouncing around in embryology that can then be co-opted and go off in different directions. So you're not, really, you're not really selecting for evolvability, you're selecting for robustness, mm -hmm. which has the side effect of opening up new channels for, for evolvability. That's very interesting, yeah. yeah.